Welcome everyone, I'm Becky. And I'm Vince. From the Rock Living Room to yours, welcome. We are so glad you're joining us today. We're about to begin worship, and we also have a brand new sermon series starting today okay. that's gonna get really real. I'm really excited for you. I wanna encourage you to share this message with all your friends, your families, even with people you don't like. Let's get together and worship together, even if we're not in the same physical location. Yes, and wherever you are, maybe it's a different city or a different country, please know God sees you, He loves you, and He wants to meet you. He wants to meet you exactly where you are today. Let's take a moment and turn our attention to him actually before we begin worship. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much, Father, for every single person tuning in right now, God. I thank you for their hearts to press into whatever it is you have for them, God, and I pray that their hearts are open to receive, Lord. Uh, speak to us in a fresh new way, Lord. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Rock Church family, come on, get up on your feet. We're gonna lift the name of Jesus. We invite you to sing with us, clap with us. From wherever you're watching, whether it's at home and or anywhere in the United States or around the world, come on, sing with us. Put your hands together like this.
King of Kings. Come on, we invite you to join with us and sing. One, two, three.
church. See, I'm not afraid, no, I'm not, to show you my weakness. My failures and flaws, God, you see them all, and you still call me for Cause the God of the mountain is the God
start just before dawn this might be the hardest season you've experienced i know it hurts it won't be too long cause you're closer than you think you are you're closer than you've been before so look to the sky help is on the way it's not over. It's not ending. It's not Come on, ending. raise your voice and sing this with us. It's not the end. It's not the end. It's only the beginning when God is in there. All things are new. All things are new. All things are new. All things are new. Things are new. Things are new.
Hi everyone, I'm Vince. And I'm Becky from The Rock Living Room to yours. Welcome, it's so great to have you today. Becky, that was such a powerful time of worship. Yes. And what I love is that worship doesn't begin or end with a Sunday service. We have an invitation from the Almighty God mm. to live lives of worship by engaging with God wherever we are throughout the week. Oh, so good, so, so true. We're about to jump into the sermon, but before we do, we wanna know how you doing today. Let us know. <laughs> Here's an idea, drop in an emoji in the chat and let us know how you doing. Also, if it's your first time with us and you'd like to take the next step to learn more about the church and get plugged into the life of the church, go ahead and visit surock.com backslash info or text info to 52525. That's right. Let's get you connected and plugged into a community. Life class is a great place to start if you want to get connected, whether you're new to The Rock or you've been a part of our family for a while. Mm. This class teaches you about the culture, the mission, and the DNA of our church. It's also going to help you under uncover and understand your unique identity and the gifts that God has given you. I really want to encourage you to participate today. To learn more about Life Class, visit sdrock.com slash life class or text the word life to 52525. Yes, another way to get plugged in is groups. We have groups that meet online and in person covering a variety of topics. There is a place for everyone, no matter what season of life you're in. And I know plugging into community, it takes time, it takes intentionality, and it can feel like a really big investment, but I promise you, it is so, so worth it. Even Jesus, who's walking around, healing the sick, ministering to people, doing all kinds of important yeah. things, he took time to sit around a table and hang out and invest in his friends. So family, visit sdrock.com backslash groups or text groups to okay, 52525. Preach a little bit. <laughs> so good. We're about to start today's message from Pastor Miles. Today, we're gonna be diving into the topics of sin and mm -hmm. the enemy. I know this topic can wow. feel a little heavy, but we realize it's so important to engage in this conversation as a church, get real with ourselves and get real before God. I know this one is gonna be an impactful one, so you don't wanna miss it. Amen, I'm glad that we're tackling that. Yes, and the sermon is about to start, so it's your last chance, family. Go ahead, press that share button. Enjoy service. Happy Sunday, happy Sunday. How you doing, everybody? I'm Miles McPherson, Pastor of the Rock Church, and welcome to church today. Um, we're gonna do a two-week series on the devil called the enemy, and I am so excited about the insight that God has given me to give you about the spiritual warfare you are in. And so it is, it's it's gonna be incredible if you pay attention, come these next two weeks. And um, please hit the share button, get this out to your friends because we are all in a spiritual battle constantly every day. Why don't we stand up, wherever you're at, stand up and we're gonna pray and ask God to reveal to our heart the spiritual battle that we're in and open our eyes up to the temptations and the lies that we're being told every single day. So why don't you stand up. Close your eyes, bow your head. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you so much for your goodness. And thank you for revealing the truth to us. Thank you for revealing and opening our eyes to see the things that we cannot see, that we may walk in the light and get out of the darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. Get your Bibles out. Get your Bibles out. We need the Word of God. On the count of three, say word. One, two, three, say word. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, the first book in the Bible. First book in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. Uh, when I first became a youth pastor, man, 30-something years ago, almost 40 years ago, I went to Philadelphia to, see, uh, to speak at this youth camp. It was like the first week I was officially a youth pastor. And I go back to Philadelphia, and at the time, the football stadium was called the Veteran Stadium. It was called Veteran Stadium. It's where the Philadelphia Eagles played. And I'm driving to Philly to this youth camp or, or you know, out of the city, and there was traffic from New York, New Jersey, all around Pennsylvania going to the stadium. So I drove past the stadium, and there was a sign that said um, Satan was having a swap meet. And so I'm like, what? So I go, I want to see what's going to happen. There's traffic everywhere. People have pickup trucks and vans and all kind of cars, and I get to the stadium and all around the parking lot are these booths with tables and little canopy tent things with demons standing behind the tables. And they're giving all this stuff away for free, guns, disease, pornography, all this way, you know, terrorism stuff, just garbage stuff designed to destroy your life. And I'm walking around tripping because people are taking this stuff for free. And they're walking around the stadium just grabbing stuff, grabbing stuff, putting it in their cars. And I'm looking, at, and in the middle of the parking lot is a stadium. And there's a sign that says, no admittance, Satan only. 
And Satan's on top of the stadium looking down at all the activity, all his demons. So I'm like, what are you doing? He said, oh, Miles, I'm destroying all these people's lives. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, all that stuff that they're taking is designed to destroy their life and, and bring death into their life. I said, well, what's in the stadium? He said, that's my number one weapon. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I can't force those people to take that stuff and use it to destroy their lives and their families and their careers. I use it, I get them to do that by using my number one weapon against them. It's a weapon I use against every person, every day, all day. And every time someone sins, I'm using this weapon successfully in their life. So I was like, so you're telling me you can't force all these people, but you're, use, you're, you're, for, you're tricking them and deceiving them with your number one weapon. He said, exactly right. I said, well, what is it? He said, well, if I tell you what it is, I'm going to beat you. You can, you can beat me at my own game, so I'm not going to tell you. So I said, look, I'm going to read the Bible because all truth is in the Bible. And if you want to find the truth about something, God will reveal it through his words somehow. So I went to Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and I got to Genesis 3. And I'm going to read this story because we are going to discover the devil's number one weapon. Now, why is this critical? Because the devil is your enemy and he uses against you every single day. He is using it against you right now. He's using it against your mother, your family, your parents, all your kids, all your friends. Every person you know, he is using his number one weapon every single day, all day, all the time. And every time you sin, he uses this weapon. Matter of fact, he can get you to look yourself in the mirror and say, this is going to be really bad for me. And still you will do it because that's how effective his weapon is. So let's read Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. We're in Genesis chapter 3. And it says, The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? Now, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, God created the heavens and the earth. And he created, man, he created the trees, the birds, the bees, the fish. And then he created man. And then he created woman in his image. And he told him to be fruitful and multiply. And he says, you can have anything in the world, just don't eat from that tree. And the Bible says that the devil was more cunning and deceitful than anything God had made. And he came to the woman and said, did God really say? Now, you have to understand the devil's character is known by the devil's name. Here are his names. Destroyer, murderer, accuser, thief, liar. Father of lies, why would you have anything to do with someone whose names are destroy a murder, accuse a thief, liar, father of lies? My, my wife and I, when we were dating, we used to go to a club and I would go to the bathroom and come back and there'd be dudes talking to her. And I was like, this is before I was saved, I was going, I'd go crazy. I'd be like, want to fight right there. I'd fight two or three dudes. Like, let's go outside. I, and luckily they never took me up on it, but I was like really jealous and really um, aggressive. And I knew that those guys weren't trying to tell her to be faithful to me. They were trying to get her number. Whenever you talk with the devil, you are talking to a liar. You are talking to a destroyer, a murderer. It's like, it's like if you're a young lady, you go to the, you're in store and some guy wants to talk to you and you ask, he asks you your name and you tell him your name is Mary. And then you ask him his name and he says his name is Player. Are you going to date that dude? You shouldn't. So whenever you have a conversation with the devil, you're having a conversation with a murderer, a deceiver, the father of lies. And look what he says to Eve. Has God indeed said? If you do not know what this says, he will tell you his version. This is why you need to read the Bible, memorize the Bible, live the Bible, talk about the Bible. Because if you don't know the truth, you're going to believe a lie. You're going to believe a lie. And then he says to the woman, we may, she says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat nor shall you touch lest you die. That's what she said. Now God didn't say anything about touching it, but I'm going to give her A minus on Bible memory. But here is the number one weapon of the devil. The serpent said, you will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Here is the devil's number one weapon. It is a twofold lie. You believe this every single day. You believe this every single day, 
all day. Every time you have a lustful thought, a prideful thought, every time you tell half truth, every time you do something you know you shouldn't do, you are falling prey to this twofold lie. Number one, that sin has no consequence. You believe you're going to get away with it. Now, if you lie knowing you're going to get caught and punished and you do it anyway, that's just, you're just double stupid. But in your mind, you're thinking, I think I'm going to get away with this. You look at stuff on your phone, I'm going to get away with it. When you don't tell the whole truth, when you, when you, when you fudge information on your taxes, I'm going to get away with it. And then you also believe that you can be like God and be in control of your whole life. You cannot be in control of your whole life. And all day long the devil saying, you ain't going to get caught. Take control. You ain't going to get caught. It's your life. It's your body. It's your career. That's your money. That's your house. No, it's not. You have no idea when you're going to die. You have no idea how you're going to die. You have no idea what's going to happen in five minutes. You have so little control over your life, and yet the devil would put it in your head that you can have control over your life and that you can make a decision on right and wrong. God doesn't want you making decisions on right and wrong. He just wants you to obey him. Give an example. You could be walking down the street and there's a homeless person there asking for money. And you think, well, it's the right thing to do to help. And God may tell you no and the next person yes. Because what God's doing in that person's life and what God's doing in your life, your job is simply to obey. I was in Mexico 30 years ago as a, when I was a youth pastor. And we had these kids in Mexico that we were down there to um, bring some food and clothes and work with some kids in the orphanage. And I'm standing outside the church, and this little girl comes up to me, and she says, zapatos, yo quiero zapatos, she want, I want shoes. But we had bags of shoes. She had a little dress on, a little ponytail. She was probably about four or five years old. She had no shoes on, standing in the mud. It was rainy, it was chilly. And God told me, do not give her any shoes. So I was like, no zapatos, no zapatos. And, and she walked around and asked a few people, and then she walked away. And... The pastor came out and said, as a matter of fact, and then one of the kids came out and gave her a bag of shoes and she walked down the hill. And the pastor came out and said, if that girl comes back, don't give her any shoes. I said, why not? Because all she's going to do is go down the hill and sell them. It's a scam. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, the good thing to do, the right thing to do is to help the little girl. We came down here with the shoes. We came down to help the kids. Here's a kid in need. Why don't I do that? See, how could I be wrong? God, what do you want me to do? So it's not about us deciding right and wrong. It's a matter of us knowing what the God says. And then in the moment, God, how do you want me to apply your truth? So number one, the number one weapon of the devil every single day is one, that your sin will not bring you any consequences. And two, you can be in control of your own life. So what do you do? Let's read the story. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was food, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, and sewed fig leaves together and made coverings. This is amazing to me. God makes man, and, and the Bible says that they were naked, but they didn't know it till after they sinned. Well, why didn't they know it before they sinned? There's a study, a science called um, biophotonics, bio for biology, living things. Photonics, photograph, a photon is the smallest unit of light. Biophotonics is the study of light coming out of living things. So when something is alive and healthy, it glows. Little babies have a glow to their skin. Uh, women who are in love have a glow to their skin. People who are young have more glow than people who are old. When you get old, you get dusty and crusty. <laughs> but when you're young, you're bright. That's why this mascara and facial products is a multi-billion dollar business because it's all designed to give that glow back. And that glow is biophotonics. It's the light coming out of living things. Well, the theory is, the idea is that Adam and Eve... They had no sin. The light coming out covered their nakedness. And as soon as they sinned, the light was muted and they saw their physical bodies. When Jesus talks about us being the light of the world, it's spiritual and really literal physically. And so what happened was they sinned and all of a sudden 
Their eyes were open. It's ironic when we sin a lot of times right after we do it, we realize we did something wrong. And we realize that something changed in the spiritual realm in our life. We may not realize it's spiritual, but we realize something changed. And then it says, when Adam heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, he hid, him and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees. Um, I have a question for you. Can you hide from God? Nope. Can you hide your thoughts from God? Nope. Can you hide your actions from God? Nope. Can you hide your intentions from God? Nope. So why do you try? My, uh, my wife and I, we have three kids, and she was in labor with our first child um, 12 hours. She was in labor with our second child 24 hours. She was in labor, labor with our third child 49 hours, our son. And his head was stuck five hours. And when he was born, I mean, his head was just big. It was so big that when he would cry and when he started walking, his head would rub on the carpet. It was that big. His, him and his sister would play hide and seek and she would hide behind his head. That's how big his head was. But we would play hide and seek. And he would go, I said, I said Miles, you can go hide, but, I, you know, how you go, where are you going to hide your head? So I would count. He would come, Dad, Dad, let's play hide and seek. So I would count and he would go hide. So I'm counting. One, two. And I can hear him running through the house because his head is banging on the wall. And then he would hide behind a little tiny plant. Come on down here with me, camera. He would hide behind a little tiny skinny plant like this. And he's got four feet ahead over here and four feet ahead over here. And he's thinking, I can't see him. And I can hear him going, he, he got his hands over his eyes. He, he can't see us. And I'm walking in the house going, where's Miles? Where's Miles? And he's hiding behind his little tiny skinny plant. But he thinks that because he can't see me because he got his hands over his eyes. I can't see him. And as he's hiding, his sister's hiding behind his head. A lot of times we think just because we can't see God, God can't see us. We think because we can't hear God, God can't hear us. And we think because God's not standing right there looking at us, he doesn't know everything that's going on in our life. Let A, stop hiding from God. Stop hiding from God. Stop hiding your thoughts from God. Stop hiding your intentions from God. Stop thinking that he doesn't see everything that's going on in your life. The Bible says then, the Lord called to Adam and said, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Where are you? He wasn't asking what rock are you behind. What he was asking was, you did exactly what I told you not to do. Are you better off now than you were before? Acknowledge the fact that you are hurting. Acknowledge the fact that you are distant from God. Acknowledge the fact that your sin really did and does have consequences in your life. When I was taking these kids to Mexico, there was a young kid named Danny. And I have a picture of him to this day, a little redhead kid red freckles, and he was 12, hanging out with high school kids. And we have a picture of all of us in, in Mexico, big smiles, and he was on fire for God, preaching the gospel at 12, hanging out with high school kids. We lost touch years later, six, seven years later, I'm in juvenile hall, talking to these guys, most of them in gangs, right here in San Diego. And I start telling the story I'm telling you now. And they said, that's Danny. He's down the hall. Same kid, down the hall. They go get him. He comes walking in the room. He had been stabbed. He was in a, he's a white kid, red hair, red freckles in a Mexican gang. Go figure. He comes in, sits in the front row. Broke my heart because I remember when, I used to, when he was in Bible study, when he was in church, going to Mexico. I said, Danny. You remember going to Bible study? Yeah. You remember preaching the gospel? Yeah. You remember going to Mexico, helping the kids down there? Yeah. I said, I'm going to ask you one question. And if you say that you are better off now than you were before, I'll never preach the gospel again. Are you better off now than you were before? Of course he said no. Who would want to be in jail versus being out and 
walking with God. That's what God said to Adam, where are you? God said to Adam, you did exactly what I told you not to do. You did all the stuff. The one thing I told you not to do that would break our relationship. Are you better off now? This is a question we have to ask ourselves. As the devil hits us with this number one weapon, and we know it because we contemplate it, as the devil convinces you to do the things you know are going to hurt yourself and hurt your relationship with God, and then you do it, you have to ask yourself, where are you? Where are you? You look at all these famous people breaking the law and doing all this stuff and going to jail. What did it get them? Not only did they have anything the money could buy, they wanted to have to have more. They had to have it their way and they got caught. Acknowledge your pain. Next thing, confess your sin. Just confess your sin. Look what it says. It says he, t- verse 11, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I told you you should not eat. And the man said, the woman whom you gave me, she gave me of the tree that I ate. You have to take responsibility for your own sin. You cannot ever blame somebody else. It's like, well, listen, I, you know, that wasn't me. The woman gave it, it, it. I blame it on the woman. And the woman said, oh, the, the, the serpent did it. I, 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 it, wasn't, it wasn't me. It was a serpent. And every single one of us has this propensity to defend ourselves and blame somebody else. So here's my question to you. If you think about your life, if you think about what you do, how you live, what you eat, what you do in your off time, what you watch on TV, what you watch on the Internet, the things you think about, how you talk to people, how you talk about people, your spiritual disciplines or lack of spiritual disciplines, how much of that is instigated by the devil's number one weapon? How much are you trying to get your way, cut corners, have your cake and eat it too, instead of just obeying God? The enemy, the devil is so slick and so patient. And all he has to do is trip you once and let you get used to that, trip you again, let you get used to that, trip you again. Let you get used to that. And next thing you know, your life has gone away over here. And then like a mousetrap, bam, the hammer falls. But it was gradual, gradual, gradual. There's a metaphor about PR and marketing that they say you, you take this big gigantic rock, you take a little tiny hammer and you hit the rock. The big gigantic boulder, hit it again. And just keep tapping it. Just keep tapping it. You don't have to hit it hard. And every time you tap it, a little crack. A little crack. A little crack. And one day they're going to do this. And the whole thing falls apart. That's what the devil's doing. He's just tapping you, tapping you. And it all starts and ends with his number one weapon. He is telling you and convincing you your sin will not Bring punishment. You can get away with it. Number two, you can be like God. You're smart enough. You're talented enough. You can do whatever you want. I'm telling you, the Bible says the penalty of your sin is death. All of us have sinned and all of us listen to those lies and we slip up. We slip up. The penalty is death. The end of something that's living. And here's Adam and Eve walking with God, created in God's image, covered in light, walking in God. And next thing you know, they're hiding behind a rock. The intimacy with God was destroyed. Their innocence between God destroyed. Their trust with God destroyed. All that death happened. And then they got kicked out of the garden. So their, 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 their uh, um, ability to be in the garden was destroyed. All that died on, and then death came into the world. The death resulted, we still impact. So here's the thing. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You and I have sinned and we can never be good enough on our own. The Bible says the penalty is death, relationships, health, vision, opportunity, jobs. All this death comes when we believe that our sin has no consequence. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He paid the price for your sin. He died. And then he rose from the dead. 
And if you would like to give your life to him and receive salvation and be set free from the lies of the devil, it doesn't mean he won't come after you, but now you have the power with the spirit of God, you have the power and the eyes to see what he's doing. If you want that for your life, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Now, when you pray this prayer, it's not some, you're not checking the box. You're actually surrendering your life to Jesus. There was a guy who walked across a tightrope. It's a long wire that went across this waterfall. And it took him three hours to walk across the tightrope. Got to the other side and said, I'm going to go back and do it again. I'm going to put a wheelbarrow on top, fill it with dirt. And he asked the crowd, do you all believe I can do this? They said, yes, we believe. So he put the wheelbarrow on top, put the dirt in the wheelbarrow and started walking. And he looked down at this little boy and said, do you believe I can take this wheelbarrow across this wire? And the little boy said, I believe. And he dumped the dirt out and said, get in and go with me. When we pray this prayer, if you're saying you want Jesus to forgive you of your sin, open your eyes, empower you to resist the devil's number one weapon, you got to get in the wheelbarrow. And you got to stay in the wheelbarrow because it's only through the power of God that you're going to be able to withstand the lies of the devil. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about how much the devil has been deceiving you, lying to you, ripping you off, all the things that have died. And I want you to think how much God loves you and how much he wants to set you free. Lord, thank you so much for everybody listening. Thank you for the people who want you to forgive them. If you would like to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, as simple as A, B, C. Pray this prayer with me. Say, dear God, I admit that I am a sinner and that the penalty of my sin is death. I believe that Jesus loves me. And died and rose from the dead. And I confess my sin to him. Jesus, please fill me with the spirit of God. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, please text the word SAVE to 52525. We want to help you on your journey in your relationship with God. Congratulations. Uh, this is the most important decision you can ever make. Um, it, it, it changed my life. I've seen it change millions of people's lives. And I know God's going to trust you. And let me tell you something. You have to keep your eyes open so you can see when the devil is testing you, lying to you, tempting you. Because it's going to come as soon as I stop talking. If not already, he's already speaking in your head. Amen. Listen. Um, this is a part of service. I want to give you an opportunity to put God first in your giving. In your giving. I have a question for you. Do you think that when we, as we take the offering, that when we take the offering, it matters if God is first in your life? As we prepare to take our offering, I want to highlight one of the lies of the devil. When it comes time to give, the devil will tell you, take care of yourself first and give God what's left over. That's a lie. Do you think that it matters to God whether you give to him first or not first? I'm going to tell you it does. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of your increase. If it's a tithe, it's 10%. The first 10% of your increase why? So your barns will be filled with plenty. So he can bless you and we'll bless you honoring him and he will honor you. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Putting God first in your giving puts everything else second. God has to be first. If he is Lord, that means he's first. If he's master, that means he's first. If he's your creator, that means he's first. So number one, putting God first puts Everything else, second, putting God first is an act of honor. Honor the Lord with your first fruits. I am putting God a highest value on who God is. It is an act of honor. And third, putting God first secures the appropriate blessings. Your barns will be filled and your vats will overflow. So as we give, if you want to give, text the word give to 52525. I want you to give as though God is first. And have a habit of always honoring God first with your finances. 
So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. And Lord, I pray that we would have a heart to put you first in our life as you have blessed us so much in our life. And I pray you bless the offering. I pray that you move on people's hearts and that they would declare freedom from the lies of the devil that is even in their head right now. That if they give, they're not going to be able to get things that they want. And then you're not going to bless them. I rebuke those lies in Jesus' name and set them free and declare freedom over their giving and their generosity. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. That was so, so good, family. <laughs> As I was listening, I just kept thinking about that prayer David prayed in Psalm 139 where he said, search me, O God, and know my heart. That's a really honest prayer. Yeah. He was approaching God with humility and asking him to reveal what was really going on deep in his heart. We have that same invitation today. When we do that, God is faithful to meet us with so much grace. And that is the truth of the gospel. It's because of Jesus' death and resurrection that we don't have to be slaves to sin any longer. We get to walk in victory and in righteousness. Wow, amen, so good. Well, Rock family, before we wrap up, we have some exciting events coming up over the next month or so. So check out our digital bulletin to find out all the opportunities and which one's right for you. Visit srock.com backslash Sunday Bulletin or text Bulletin to 52525. That's right. Lastly, if you're joining us from San Diego on July 31st is the Do Something Church Race. Hey! This is for all of our middle and high school students, and it's kind of like a philanthropic spinoff of The Amazing Race with all kinds of obstacles, physical competitions, opportunities to serve others. You don't want to miss it. Fun. It's going to be at Liberty Station in Point Loma. And to learn more about the race and to sign up with a team, visit sdrock.com slash summer or text summer to 52525. Well, Rock family, we hope you've had the best week. Be sure to follow us on social at The Rock San Diego and head over to the, our YouTube channel for more rock messages and content. We love you so much, family. We'll see you soon.